All right. It is uh, my uh, with great pleasure that I in introduce Paulo Shakarian. Um, he'll be giving a talk today entitled Cybersecurity Applications of Artificial Intelligence. Paulo Shakarian, PhD, is a tenured associate professor at the Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University. He specializes in artificial intelligence and machine learning, publishing numerous scientific books and papers. Shakarian was named a KDD Rising Star, receiving the Air Force Young Investigator Award, received multiple Best Paper Awards, and has been featured in major news media outlets such as CNN and The Economist. Paulo has been funded by various organizations, including IARPA, um, ARO, ONR, and AF, AFOSR. Paulo also, also co-founded and led the startup company Cyber Reconnaissance, Inc., which was the first commercial solution to use machine learning to predict future exploits. The company raised over $8 million in venture capital, obtained over 80 customers, and was acquired in early uh, earlier this year, 2022. Early in his career, Paulo was an officer in the U.S. Army, where he served two combat tours in Iraq, earning a Bronze Star and the Army Commendation Medal for Valor. During his military career, Paulo also served as a DARPA fellow and as an advisor to I IARPA. He holds a PhD and MS in computer science from the University of Maryland College Park and a BS in computer science from West Point. Paulo, it's great to have you. Um, whenever you want, you can share the screen and, and go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, conference. So I'm Paulo Shakarian, and uh, let's get right into it. Uh, there's just my bio. Uh, you already heard about that. So let's talk about a real-world problem with regard to cybersecurity. So software vulnerabilities um, are cataloged in the United States by the National Institute of Standards with what's called the CVE numbering system. And this actually, uh, what I have found is it's adopted across um, pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, the CVE numbering system is associated with what's called a CVSS score, which is what's shown in this chart. Gives you an idea about how critical that software vulnerability is. And it turns out measuring the importance of vulnerabilities is extremely important because uh, there are over a thousand software vulnerabilities that are disclosed each month, new ones. And keep in mind that these are all unique. So a given software vulnerability can appear on multiple computer systems. And in fact, it will because Think about a large company. How many computers do they have running something like Windows or database software or whatever? And so as a result, um, a given company each month is going to have, you know, potentially thousands of new software vulnerabilities within their uh, organization. And what makes it tough is that uh, prioritizing which ones should be fixed, um, it's kind of a never-ending problem because if you, once you prioritize and you don't fix the rest, those other vulnerabilities, they don't go away. They kind of stay on your books and they, um, you know, so it just kind of piles up over time. Now, I talk about all this because what we see in this chart is this is showing a distribution of scores of vulnerabilities, whether they're exploited or not. And being exploited means that some hacker actually uses that vulnerability in an attack. Now, what you can't tell on this chart is it's only about you know 3% of software vulnerabilities actually get used in an attack. And it just happens that many of them get used over and over again. Now, when you look at something like the CVSS score, in terms of uh, triaging your vulnerabilities, it actually does not do a very good job. Because 
And you have to think about when the CVSS score is assigned. It's assigned when the vulnerability is discovered, not when it's exploited. Sometimes the National Institute of Standards, when it's a very widespread vulnerability, they may upgrade the CVSS score, but they don't always do that. And they only do it when the vulnerability is, is very widely exploited. And the other thing is they never downgrade. So any false positives by patching something seemingly important, uh, there's no reprieve from that. And so companies to this day really struggle with this problem, especially, you know, the large ones struggle with it because even if they have a huge investment in cybersecurity, uh, they have so many computer systems that they will literally have millions of vulnerabilities exposed in their environment on any given day. And I've, you know, when I was in my startup company, I talked with some of the largest banks on the planet and they have literally millions of vulnerabilities open on any given day. Uh, when you get to the smaller companies, they simply lack resources because cybersecurity isn't spent on as much in a smaller firm. And by small, I mean companies with still five to 10,000 employees, so still fairly large companies. So here's an example of a failure. And this was in 2018. This software vulnerability that actually had come out um, was disclosed beforehand was rated as low risk, not only by the US National Institute of Standards, but by several major companies that do a lot in cybersecurity. Microsoft explicitly had on their website that exploitation was less likely for this particular Microsoft Office vulnerability. Now, when the hackers used it, it became so widespread, it accounted for 37% of malware downloads in the fall of 2018. And part of the reason for that was people weren't prioritizing this one for patching. So our intuition that we came up with was, well, maybe people who write these exploits, they're talking about these vulnerabilities in places like the dark web prior to the exploits appearing in the wild. And at the time, uh, we were collecting information from the dark web at scale, and we could actually measure this. And we found that, yeah, when uh, something is discussed on the deep and dark web, that's what D2 web stands for, uh, you can get you know, potentially up to three months of elite time before it's exploited. Now, this is a nice intuition, and this is an interesting figure, but the question then becomes, you know, can this be used to make predictions? And so that's what we decided to explore in our research. So this shows the basic setup for, you know, what we did research on and eventually productized. And the idea was to use a feature-based machine learning methodology where we would collect indicators from the dark web, the deep web, social media, and other places online, as well as technical aspects about the vulnerability itself. And these features we would use in a feature-based machine learning approach to compute a probability of exploitation. And then when we actually went to create the product for the startup company, we had to do things like have an API, report generation, and stuff like that to support workflow. Now, the features, uh, talking about those for a minute, you know, roughly we could divide it into four big categories. And one was content. Um, and in the scientific work, we started out with doing things initially with TFIDF, which was surprisingly effective. Um, we also did some joint work with uh, University of Southern California on using LTSM. But then uh, in the company, what we found was effective was 
using uh, transformer architecture neural models to generate features that would then get used with the other features in the feature-based approach. Uh, but at the end of the day, the point was is that, you know, in these hacker forums, there would be discussions and they'd use words like exploit and is this vulnerability similar to something else I use. We also found that if we map out with a graphical structure, the relationships between hackers in these forums, we could use that information as well. And we could use this as proxy for their reputation. And the idea there was, if you have a more reputable hacker or a hacker who in the past has launched, who has talked about vulnerabilities that were used in attacks, maybe when he does it again, it'll be more likely to be used. There were also, we discovered that there was various pieces of metadata about the sites where these conversations took place, as well as um, information about aspects of the conversation, such as the language used, that were also factors. So for instance, we found that uh, the probability of a vulnerability at random being discussed on a Russian website being used in an attack was much higher than the probability of a vulnerability randomly being discussed on a Chinese website. Now, this still wouldn't mean that every Russian or even the majority of Russian conversations about a vulnerability would lead to exploitation, but this was just something that you could think of as increasing the prior. And finally, was technical information. So initially, we used technical information as features. Uh, but as we matured this work in our deployed software in the company, we actually went and we used technical information to create a variety of different models, whereby for different operating systems and platforms, we found that the hacker communities that discuss those vulnerabilities uh, would uh, give a rise to different distributions. So hence a, a different model was more appropriate as opposed to just simply adding these things as a feature. So putting all this together, we did a direct comparison with the CVSS scoring, which at the time was uh, the state of the art. So just in our scientific studies, we found that, you know, we significantly reduced false positive rates and increased the area under the curve. Now, looking at a little different type of curve, precision versus recall, and this is focused on the exploited class, this actually tells what's the more important story because you know, what we found in working with uh, large companies who had cybersecurity teams is really what they're after is reduction of false positives. And so if you tell them that a vulnerability is going to be exploited, number one, that's the class they care about. And number, uh, and the reason for that is, is that it's such a minority class, uh, simply saying that not everything's not going to be exploited will give you an artificially higher accuracy. So what we looked at is comparison of precision versus recall. And, you know, what you get is, you know, you could still get a 40% recall, you can get about 50 to 60% precision with the really basic approach that we talked about before. Um, this might not seem like the best uh, numbers, but actually it's important because remember, we're talking about a class that is representing less than 3% of the population, which is the class you care about. So even having precision that is only like 20%, you're still doing 10 times better than random guess. What is interesting is that we significantly improved upon these numbers once we created the company. 
And that had a lot to do with using multiple models. And we also did things with different tiers of models whereby um, we would have certain models, if there was no dark web information, we would actually have a different class of model. If there was lesser technical information, we would also lead to a different type of model. And so accounting for that in our ensemble uh, greatly improved performance beyond the numbers you see here. Additionally, this also does not consider uh, the social network information, nor does it consider uh, some of the enhancements that we did practically, um, for example, using the transformer language models to generate additional features. So we'll talk a little bit about the social graphs. And this was really interesting. Um, what we actually did is we invested in using Neo4j as a graphical database. And we stored, uh, we created a multimodal graph that showed relationships between people in these forums and their messages uh, that they write to each other. And this would allow us to create different types of transitive closures over the space graph. So for example, for some hyperparameter K, we'd say two users were related to each other if they shared posts and K number of messages. Um, this, uh, you know, this is also important from other perspectives in that we would see that there would be users who would span multiple websites on places like the dark web and who would actually use the same username across those different websites. And in some of the work that predated the exploit prediction stuff where we actually published some papers just looking at the data collection aspect, we found that there were individuals that would inhabit multiple sites. And so accounting for that uh, from a feature perspective was very important. And so what we wanted to do first was once we created the graph, could we examine graph-based features about individuals that would be related to things like exploitation of vulnerabilities uh, that would significantly um, contribute to predictive ability? And that's what we see in these box plots. Here we looked at some, you know, we looked at a lot of different graphical measures, but just to illustrate the point, uh, we look at, you know, eigenvector centrality values at the bottom. Um, and you look at exploited versus not. So you see the individuals who are involved in vulnerabilities that are not exploited would have a very have a much lower eigenvector centrality than those that were involved in that. And we had a similar thing with you know the out degree. And you can see a visualization of a subset of the graph on the slide as well. So we took the graphical features that um, you know, where the probability of exploitation was significantly greater than the prior. And in this paper is when we started looking at more formally categorizing our features. So what you see here, this is an ablation test, and we categorize the features in a couple of uh, different ways where we had content, uh, we had aspects of uh, the language, uh, CWE is technical information about the weaknesses of vulnerability exploits, social network information, and the CVSS score. And so uh, note that precision and recall numbers here are shown with respect to vulnerabilities discussed on the dark web. So they're a little bit higher than what's seen on the other slide, but still, these precision recall and F1 numbers are all with respect to the minority class, uh, those that are exploited. And so when we look at the ablation study, we see when the social network features are removed, 
there is a significant impact on recall uh, when they're removed, although precision uh, remains approximately the same. When you look at the chart on the right-hand side, this is looking at classification when only individual sets of these features are used. When we actually see that, at least from an F1 perspective, the social network information um, by itself performs about as well as content information by itself. But the ablation study tells us that the social network information is allowing us to predict additional software vulnerabilities the content information alone uh, does not give us insight into. And I think this is pretty interesting because it could be that more reputable hackers don't need to say a lot. So don't give us a lot of features to work with. But when people see them post, they, they kind of know, hey, that guy's talking about a legitimate exploit. So, you know, again, the social network stuff turned out to be something that was very powerful uh, that we were able to add to this. So as we deployed this, so this is a slide that was created by the company and was actually did not appear in published papers. And so what here we're looking at is the distribution of this likelihood score. So uh, the likelihood score, all that is, is we would take the probability of exploitation returned by the machine learning model and simply divide it by the prior because we found with the customers communicating this vulnerability is so many times more likely to be exploited than the prior uh, was an effective way uh, to talk about it. So because you're talking about something that's like two to 3%, if the relative likelihood was uh, greater than or equal to 30, that would be the highest score. And of course, at the lower end, if it's around one, that means it's, you know, the extra information that the machine learning algorithm or machine learning model looked at uh, didn't really add much because it wasn't much more than average. So these two pie charts are very telling because we're looking at the set of all vulnerabilities from 2019 to 2021. And then chart B looks at vulnerabilities with a CBSS score lower than seven. And the machine learning model was making these predictions independently of the CVSS score was above or below seven. Now, What's interesting here is seven is considered a best practice for patching uh, in cybersecurity. It's again, this number that's not produced by any kind of machine learning uh, that the National Institute of Standards came up with. And as a result, because it's best practice, the National Institute of Standards, I think became quite conservative in classifying a lot of vulnerabilities with a score above seven, roughly 60%. Now, what this causes to happen is companies, as a result, they cannot patch everything with a CVSS score above seven because you're talking still on the order of six, 700 new vulnerabilities each month. And so that's still too much. Um, whereas the scores from the model were you know, much giving much more reasonable amounts. And that's what we'll show on the next slide. So, um, like I mentioned before, we had kind of divisions between models um, when we created the company. And one of the ones we found was most important was uh, the difference between cross-site scripting and non-cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and SQL injection, uh, actually cross-site scripting slash SQL injection. And this makes some intuitive sense if you know just a little bit about cybersecurity because uh, cross-site scripting and SQL injection vulnerabilities, you know, those tend to be external kind of website sort of things uh, without a lot of, you know, really deep 
engineering and, and malware research uh, involved. Whereas the rest is these are where you get things like your Windows vulnerabilities, your Office vulnerabilities, your vulnerabilities against, you know, Apache Tomcat and so on. And so what we looked at here is, um, you know, for during this time period, uh, the fraction of vulnerabilities uh, that had a given likelihood score over 10, over 20, and maximum likelihood. Uh, and we look at the percentage of predictable exploits. So every now and then there would be exploits that um, there would be no, there would be the vulnerability would not even be known until after the exploit happened. So we discount those because that can't be predicted in this paradigm because it's not been prior identified. So, um, so we this is focused here on on recall, uh, and this is the kind of metrics that we ended up using a lot because hey, for a certain cutoff, you know what is uh, the recall. Uh, and that way you can communicate in terms of number of vulnerabilities with that cutoff and understand, hey, um, you know, what fraction of vulnerabilities are you uh, catching ahead of time? So uh, in my view from talking with companies, the more important of these numbers tended to be uh, the red one. I'm sorry, the, the yellow one rather, because uh, those are usually the tougher vulnerabilities to fix. And so when you look at a likelihood score over 10, um, you're talking about um, over this time period from March to August, only 137 out of the 6,000 plus vulnerabilities of that time uh, that get that get tagged, yet you're still um, hitting about half of the, more than half of the vulnerabilities that are predictable. And this well outperforms what happens with CVSS. And we'll look at that in a moment right here. Thinking back to the pie chart we saw earlier, remember the distribution of likelihood scores that come from the model is roughly the same on whether it's the CVSS of above seven or below seven. Now notice here that, um, you know, below seven vulnerabilities that were predictable, um, you know, is still a significant number. Uh, here you have 25. But again, half of those, uh, more than half of those can be predicted uh, with this approach. And then when you look at things like cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, we're actually getting much, much higher numbers as well. For best practices, the number that gets patched is zero. And so this is, you know, quite an important thing to bear in mind. And this is why we were able to uh, sell this as a product because there was no other way to predict these. Now we had um, we found that beyond standard uh, vulnerability management and cybersecurity, there was actually an application to what is called application security. And we came across this with a large company that was a client of ours, and they had an application security group. Now, application security is different from cybersecurity in that it deals with vulnerabilities from software that's produced in-house. However, the software that's produced in-house uses a number of libraries and platforms that come from other places and will also have vulnerabilities. Now, this is typically outside of a cybersecurity group because normally it falls under like the chief technology officer or you know, software engineering. And these vulnerabilities are notoriously difficult to fix because once you have a bunch of code written that is working with a specific library or, or platform, it becomes very difficult to disentangle due to all the dependencies 
So these are very complex problems to deal with and they need a lot of lead time. So this client, what we did was we uh, set them up with, you know, the API that was feeding the results of the model. And they started making patching decisions um, based on those results. And the interesting thing about it is they had a totally different workflow. And also really important for application security was lead time. Now, we, we also had done some measurements about how far in advance, you know, the warnings came out and stuff like that. And in this case, um, you know, it turned out that this was, you know, one of the key ways that this company got value out of what we were providing. So uh, the feedback from this Fortune 500 company is shown in blue. In uh, July of 2021, there were multiple disclosures by the National Security Agency about foreign hackers using uh, these exploits in the wild. Uh, and the Fortune 500 company had already patched them based on results from the model um, in February. And this was really interesting to see, you know, how this use case arise. And, you know, this kind of also led to some other things we looked at on how else we could support application security in this uh, very unique use case. So while I won't make the claim that this was a fully explainable approach, because quite frankly, it wasn't. It used, you know, feature-based models, um, the, you know, random forest trees that would make the prediction would be based on random subsets of the data. And there'd be so many trees, that I don't think it would have been reasonable to visualize in any meaningful way. However, we would provide transparency on the data that supported the given features, and especially for things like relating to the content of the discussions and the hackers involved. You could go back and you could actually see the data that generated those features that led to a prediction. And um, one of our uh, biggest successes was in 2017 before a widespread ransomware attack called WannaCry. And here our platform picked up this hacker conversation on a Russian hacking forum. And it showed a direct discussion about the vulnerability where the hackers not only, um, let me point this out, where they not only talked about the vulnerability itself, which is listed here, MS-17010, but they even talked about the number of infected systems. And they talked about that this was mainly in medical centers in developed parts of the world. And also they talked about the use of ransomware. So it turned out that this vulnerability was used to launch ransomware. The initial, um, the initial targets were the British NHS, which was a medical center. And the first day of this widespread ransomware attack, it was about 60,000 systems that were hit. And this conversation happened before all of that. Uh, it was interesting to see. Also, we went back and looked at some of the conversations from this Russian hacking forum a couple of weeks after the attack. And there were people talking about the aftermath and different things that could have, they could have done, such as change the price of ransom and why more money wasn't made off the ransomware, stuff like that. So anyway, um, you know, so this uh, was really just meant to give you kind of a taste of what we did um, in terms of making predictions about which software vulnerabilities would be exploited. Uh, from my perspective, you know, it was a really exciting bit of research to do uh, for a couple of reasons. First was the gathering of, of kind of novel information, particularly from the dark web, 
been working to figure out how to translate that into, um, you know, into features that could be used by a machine learning algorithm in a repeatable way. You know, that was a very challenging problem because, uh, you know, doing that consistently across many dark websites is tough. Um, Viviana? No, I think she was just turning to somebody in, in her office. Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, so I mean, that was a very challenging problem at the start. Um, getting the stuff to work in the lab, you know, always that has its uh, difficulties and, you know, making sure the experiments are done correctly and in a repeatable way, uh, you know, is, is also, you know, that was interesting. And we actually had reviewer comments that caused us to also go back and, and do things like um, add permutations to our training data to see what happens if an adversary were to try to inject false information to the dark web. Uh, it turned out the method was actually quite robust against that when we, we did those things. But then actually deploying it and having it support, um, you know, real world operations for a few years, we got a lot of lessons out of that that I would have never gotten in the research lab. Uh, we understood a lot better about how distributions of data can change over time, how to, you know, machine learning ops and the underlying, um, you know, technology behind the models, how those two interact with each other in, in very interesting ways. Uh, and it's also a little scary because if there is a drop in performance, you know, it's a very tough question on should we retrain the model? Is this drop in performance indicative of a change in the distribution of the data? Or is this just an outlier and we should just continue to go on with our current models? And it's very tough to be able to tell the difference. Uh, we've also had instances where the nature of a particular site would change that would lead to false positives, which was kind of also an adversarial type issue, although it wasn't caused by an adversary. Um, and we came up with some kind of engineering focused ways on, you know, how to automatically allow the models to detect uh, when uh, the distribution of features within the given data source had, had changed. So anyway, I'll pause right there and I'll open it up to any questions. Great, thank you very much, Paula, for the, such an interesting talk on, on things that are so applied as you were mentioning. Um, one of the questions that we received is I think one of the classic questions, um, you mentioned a little bit about the, the hackers, the possibility of hackers injecting false information. Um, are there any other things that hackers could do to counter these efforts? You know, it's um, for this in particular, uh, in theory, yes, you could have a hacker post discussions about a software vulnerability that they're not actually exploiting. And there have been some isolated incidents for vulnerabilities where hackers have done that. But I don't think. My, my gut feeling is that, and we, in years of running this model to support customers, so we, you know, so I directly was involved in, in managing this to serve customers from about 2018 to, you know, 2021, so about three years. Uh, we never really ran into that, despite we had stories from people doing vulnerability management who would have one-off cases of fake vulnerabilities. And I think the difference is, is that um, our approach is using features and using stuff based on historical data. So for a hacker to screw up the model, they would have to post information about fake vulnerabilities multiple times. It's too much effort, I guess. And yeah, it's not only too much effort. But if they would post information about fake vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities would never show up, it wouldn't show up in the ground truth either. Right. So I think that's part of the reason why it's 
a little bit robust against that. Um, because a big reason hackers will discuss these things is to establish reputation so then they can sell malware platforms that use the exploits um, in more private uh, you know, digital interactions. And so they're not going to build that reputation if they talk about stuff that's not real. Right. And that's, I guess, the, the social aspect is also something that's very interesting to me. It, it's it's uh, it's quite shocking to see that, I guess, even though the, the hackers, they of course, they want to hide from, from law enforcement and, and that kind of thing, they still need to to have their their reputation and, and their connection. So I guess that also feeds into like like you just mentioned the uh, the robustness of the approach, right? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, we think, you know, we have hypothesized that there is a little bit of a life cycle um, to hacker reputation, and it goes something like this: someone creates new identities on these forums, and they use it to over a period of time build up a reputation mostly by talking about exploits, giving free advice and stuff like that. And they're doing that to build up a, a group of clients that they can sell to privately, mm -hmm. um, not on the forum, but like kind of, you know, through like a Jabber or some other private uh, communication mm -hmm. mechanism. And once they reach a certain number of clients, those guys will disappear off the main forum. And now you can't make predictions once they do that. Right. But then we do believe that they reemerge several months later after those clients kind of go away and they need more clients in the cycle. With different starts. usernames or different different profiles or the same um, ones? We think it, it, it kind of varies. It's probably, you know, we, you know, we have with the, there's no way to falsify if, a person using um, a previous name is that same individual. Um, and likewise, there's really no way to identify if someone who is a new handle is truly new or not. Right. Um, we, you know, although I would say that a lot of that is simply overcome through the retraining process, doing retraining on a regular basis to catch those kind of things. I see. So while we wait, because there's a little bit of delay with the live streaming where we get the questions, uh, I have a question that I guess my, my typical question, and, and I, I know a lot about your research. So um, what, what can you say about the applicability of, because a, a lot of what you mentioned is, is uh, machine learning kind of stuff, you know, using directly the, the data. Uh, what can you say about applying things like um, like more on the KR side, like logic, computational logic kind of stuff? Yeah, so we actually did have um, a complementary effort that was developed under the same grant where we used temporal logic and the same kind of data to make predictions about specific cyber attacks against an organization. Now, the funder for the grant was giving us information about attacks experienced by an organization. And what we would do is we'd learn these logical rules that would say something of the form, if some certain thing was observed in a dark web forum and kind of the, you know, the work there really dealt with knowledge engineering, you know, how do you define the predicates and constants and so on. But if this thing is observed, then with a certain probability and a certain number of days, there will be an attack of this type against the organization. And, you know, so the induction uh, techniques that we use there um, really came from some of the uh, work on probabilistic rule learning um, in, you know, in, in temporal logics. And, we would um, we would also in defining the predicates we would do a couple of interesting things where we look not only at um, indicators that were akin to the features that you've seen in here, but we also looked at um, 
predicates that were based on different types of like moving averages and stuff like that, those indicators over time, then uh, we also, uh, so we, um, you know, did obtain some very good results uh, with this in the experiments for our funder. We also found that we could improve the results. You know, so we did actually, the initial work we did was just looking at, you know, if A, then B, and for every conclusion, we would then uh, just take whichever conclusion had the maximum probability if you had multiple rules. Mm -hmm. uh, when we move to a more formal deductive process for combining uh, the consequence based on the rule set, uh, then that actually also improved accuracy as well. Um, there were two things that were interesting about that is there were other performers on the project that were primarily focused on using autoregressive models that could not uh, get the kind of results we did with temporal logic. Uh, but the reason for that, and then they went on to show that they couldn't do better than a statistical baseline provided by the funder, where we were able to exceed that. Uh, the other performer actually went on to show that under Markovian assumptions, you couldn't do better than statistical baseline with an autoregressive uh, or recurrent model. Um, and that, to me, explained why the temporal logic work because we we did not make the Markovian assumption uh, in that work, and so that was that was kind of an interesting insight. Um, but then, you know, kind of the negative thing about this is the company did license uh, the technology, and we actually um, did the proof of concept with a very large credit card company. But ultimately, we decided not to productize it. And the reason was that we found that the schema in which a company would represent the attacks that affect their organization and what was defined as an attack varied widely from organization to organization. Where with the other problem I briefed to you today, understanding exploits, um, it's much easier easier to get a universal ground truth data set. Uh, there's a less controversy around what is an exploit versus what constitutes an attack. Um, and it's also not left to the decision to make that, to define those things on individual companies. So you could imagine some companies might constitute an attack as anything that breaches the firewall, where others might say it's anything that breaches a computer system, and still others may say anything that breaches beyond some certain, uh, you know, demilitarized portion of the network. And those are all very different. And then there's way more nuances than that. Um, and so that kind of, you know, so it, it was, it wasn't possible in our view to have a product that would um, collect that in a uniform way across multiple clients. Right. I guess that that speaks to the to the really wide variety of things that fall on, under the umbrella of the field of cybersecurity. Right. So there's there's not just I guess in the in the general general idea and the and the, the people who are not in working in in this area, they basically fall to one of the few things that you just mentioned or just, you know, somebody entered our network and that's it, but the, there's a lot of different things. And, and even if you consider um, uh, vulnerabilities like uh, to the human components, right, that that's a, another wide variety of things that, that fall under that umbrella as well. So uh, I see what you're saying there. Um, we have another question on the, um, on the operational side, I guess, on, on the data collection in the dark web, deep and dark web, was that something that is easy to automate or uh, was there a lot of, of human effort involved in that as well? Because that, that doesn't seem like, like something easy to do. Um, no, that it's that's incredibly difficult and expensive. Um, we were able to achieve scale and automation, but it always needed a human in the loop 
because for our, you know, if we were looking just to collect data from the dark web for the sake of collecting data, that actually would have been a lot easier. But um, the issue is that we can't arbitrarily add data uh, to create features because that would eject a lot of noise into the model that would have nothing to do with exploits. And so we would have, when we would add a new source, we would vet it before we would add it with a human. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also would need humans to, uh, you know, check what happens if a site um, stops producing data. Is it due to that site has gone away? Or is it due to um, the hacker somehow detected we were crawling? We have to use a different technique. And so these issues, none of them by themselves are particularly hard. Uh, but we found, you know, it wasn't possible to automate everything, but we could alert humans to when they had to intervene in the process. Right. So, um... So I, I guess there's there's a this the, one of the challenges of of um, delving into the, those kinds of sites and those kinds of uh, you know places is um, there's a lot of illicit activity going on as well. So you don't just want to you know throw a, a throw your 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 uh, your data probing in there and just collect everything because uh, like you said. Uh, not only is there things that they're not relevant, but you might, you know, come into contact with things that might get you in trouble as well, right? Yeah, and and I think doing any kind of operations like this, where you get into but communities involved in illicit activities, it's important to have a good relationship with your local law enforcement, because if you do come across something and you know, the big ones are, are like child pornography or people talking right. about committing acts of violence. You need to be able to report that in a way and have that relationship ahead of time so they know why you have that information to begin with and right. how you came across it. All right. I don't see any further questions. Viviana, do you see anything else? No. <clears throat> I just uh, messaged you with a question yeah, here. Yeah, I saw. And yeah, I think um, it's related yeah. to what you already answered. So right, somebody was asking about the 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 detail of the exact forums on the dark web that you took into account in, in your data collection, but, but I don't think that's available, is it? Yeah, um, that that like information about specific sites, I don't think so. But there, uh, there were um, papers that we did write a bit about um, collecting from the dark web, um, and they actually became somewhat well cited. So, uh, if you if you check out my name on Google Scholar, there's some of the top results under my name. Right. All right. I think that's it. Then, uh, thanks a lot, Paulo. That was a great talk. Very interesting uh, discussion as well. Um, with things that that really bridge be, be, between, uh, like you were mentioning, academia and and very applied things that, that actually have an impact on the real world. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, Paulo.